Hey everybody, this video is called, What Does It Mean That Jesus Loved His Own to the End? And today, we're going to step out of our pass-through study of the Old Testament, Second Chronicles, and we're going to look at a topical focus today in the New Testament. And I know uh, topical Saturdays have not been happening for a while. Our last topical Saturday was like the first week of May, but we're going to dissect the passage in John 13 today. And we're going to be looking at the topic of Jesus' love and what does it mean that Jesus loved to the end. So John chapter 13 verse 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So when we think of the word end in the New Testament, end in the ancient Greek would mean along the lines of perfection. And Jesus' love was a perfect love. It was not a reckless love, unlike what is common theolo uh, theology through some music today, like uh, Bethel that likes their song, Reckless Love. You know, Jesus' love is perfect love. And God does show love to non-believers. We find that in the gospel according to Matthew, in Matthew chapter 5. We see that God shows compassion and common grace. And we see that he causes the sun to rise on the good and evil. And God gives rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And God's love toward his church his friends his elect is a perfect saving and eternal love and when you read this chapter through chapter 17 in the gospel according to john you're going to see a great emphasis on christ's love especially when you look at jesus prayer in john 17 and we see christ's love in today's passage with washing his disciples feet as a servant and many of you, you probably would not want to touch people, other people's feet. I know some people have like a, a feet fear. You know, they, they're afraid of touching feet. And uh, Jesus did this, not just like on a regular typical day, but Jesus did this kind act of being a servant during the final hour of where his death was imminent. Not the final hour, but... He was, you know, he knew that, that his death was imminent at this point. And uh, verse 2 through 5 says, And supper being ended, the devil already having put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things in his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into the basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel, which he was girded. So, the, the, the part in this passage that interests me, one of the top things about Jesus washing his disciples' feet, is he even washes the feet of Judas. And Jesus knew that Judas had planned to betray him. And Jesus still rose from that table to wash all of his disciples' feet. And as sovereign Lord, Christ took a place of the servant to demonstrate how he loved his own to the end. And we see that Jesus had humbled himself in the form of a servant, talked about the apostle Paul uh, later on in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 on. In verse 6 through 9, it says, Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What am I doing? What I am doing you do not know now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You should never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So 
Peter failed to see the spiritual cleansing that was behind this selfless act of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Jesus was making a point of a spiritual cleansing through his humble service. And notice that Jesus said, unless he is fully uh, cleansed. Uh, verse 10 through 13, Jesus said to him, He who is bath needs only to be washed his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken the garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so am I, or for so I am. So as mentioned, the foot washing the, where Jesus is humble, being a servant to his disciples, it is a foreshadowing of the cleansing sacrifice of what was to come with the cross. And through his death, Jesus would serve them beyond the limits of human understanding. How can an innocent man be willing to lay down his life for, you know, multiple people, you know, the, the body of Christ? What kind of man would lay down his life for all his followers th uh, to come? And, you know, Jesus demonstrated through this the full extent of divine love. In uh, verse 14 through 17, it says, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. You know, so when we go through this passage, and you know, it's great to reflect on the love of Christ in it, but we we see that the love of Christ also will result in hands-on service to bless others. And we got we ought to be grabbing a grasp on Jesus' teaching right before he's dying here where he's teaching on humility and to serve others. And we must die to our own selfish desires. We must serve one another humbly to show the full extent of our love. In verse 18, it says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. So Jesus, in verse 18, is referring to his 12 disciples whom he had chosen, elected, whom he knew perfectly. And that includes the one that would fall away, Judas, who was chosen to fulfill a prophecy of Psalm 41, verse 9. And we're not going to get into the whole talk about, you know, in this video, we're not going to talk about whether Judas was saved or not. But today, let's take a nugget out of this in today's passage. In the days ahead, how about we consider, are we being a reflection of Christ? Are we serving others? And I want to finish up with Matthew chapter 5. I know I quoted this earlier, but I knew I was going to come back to it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. It says here, you have heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you, and pray uh, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. 
So when we wonder how can we love our enemies, how can we do good to those who hurt us and persecute us and, uh, you know, abuse us, whatever. When you wonder how to love your enemies, keep in mind Jesus with Judas. And that's going to wrap up today's video. We'll see you next on Tuesday. I know uh, our next chapter in, through Second Chronicles is very relevant. You're probably hearing it in tomorrow's sermons at some churches that are focused on patriotic services. So we're going to cover on Tuesday whether or not Second Chronicles chapter 7 really can relate to America. So we'll see you on Tuesday. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. God bless.